To return to some basic principles and to put everything in perspective for you, I want to remind you that fatty acid synthesis is like any other anabolic reaction that occurs in our body. Remember that the common theme with anabolic reactions is that we take some type of monomer, generally, and we link these together to form a polymer. And the challenge with these types of reactions is, of course, that generally these reactions have a positive delta G value, or in other words, they are not spontaneous. They require an input of energy to occur. So obviously this is a challenge, but our body resolves this challenge by coupling this reaction with a reaction that has a favorable delta G value, that is a delta G value less than zero. And in this case, our body uses the energy currency of our cell ATP. And of course, we know its reaction with water has a very favorable delta G value, very negative. And so when we break it down, we form ADP and a free phosphate group. Now, I just wanna remind you here that our monomer, when we're talking about fatty acid synthesis here, is acetyl-CoA. So these two carbon subunits, we're gonna link these together to form a large fatty acid chain. Now before we get into these specific steps of fatty acid synthesis, I wanna kind of take a bird's eye view first and write out what the overall chemical reaction would be for fatty acid synthesis occurring in our body. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm, I'm adding these two equations together. And just to make this super clear, I wanna remind you that in order for this reaction to occur, obviously we need to have a favorable delta G value. So overall, this is going to have a negative delta G value, which tells you, of course, that the hydrolysis of ATP is much more negative then this polymerization reaction is positive. So, of course, if we add these two delta G values together, we get an overall negative delta G value. All right, so the overall chemical reaction that I wanna write out for fatty acid synthesis is for the product of a 16 carbon fatty acid chain that is called palmitic acid. And Palmitic acid happens to be the primary product of fatty acid synthesis in our body, so we're gonna focus on this, but just so you know, our body can essentially use this uh, kind of basic uh, product of fatty acid synthesis to synthesize longer chain fatty acids if need be. So remember that we wanna start off with our monomer, which is acetyl-CoA, and I'll remind you that this is a two carbon molecule. So if we need to make a 16 carbon fatty acid, we would need eight acetyl-CoA molecules. And of course, since this is an anabolic reaction, we need ATP to make an appearance as well. And it turns out seven ATP molecules are required for this reaction. And in addition, we also actually use a molecule called NADPH. And you might recognize this from the pentose phosphate pathway, but remember that we've also produced NADPH when we've shuttled this acetyl-CoA over to the cytoplasm from the mitochondria because remember that was done by a molecule called citrate and citrate broke up into acetyl-CoA as well as oxaloacetate which in the oxaloacetate produces NADPH as it was being recycled back to pyruvate. And this is really important because it's a source of electrons that will be able to reduce any oxidized groups, any, any groups that are oxidized on this acetyl-CoA molecule. So what I will show you in a minute is that acetyl-CoA has a carbonyl group in its molecule. And of course, we want to make just carbon-carbon bonds that are essentially attached to hydrogen only. And so in order to reduce this bond, we need a source of reducing power, and NADPH is that source of reducing power. And it turns out that we need 14 NADPH molecules. So that's all of the reactants that we require, and we form this palmitic acid, and of course, we also form the byproducts of the rest of these reactants. So we form, if we started off with seven ATP, we end up with seven ADP, and of course, seven free phosphate groups and 14 NADP plus, because we've 
we've we've removed these electrons and of course we're oxidizing this now and we also end up losing some water molecules as well during the course of this reaction end up losing six water molecules and I'll actually go ahead and move the 14 down here so it doesn't confuse you and I also forgot just one more thing here so it turns out that these CoA coenzyme A functional groups here on this acetyl CoA molecule will also be removed in the process of making these carbon carbon double bonds and so will also form as a byproduct eight coenzyme A molecules. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and scroll down so that we can return to the cytoplasm and figure out how acetyl CoA is polymerized into this palmitic acid. Now because I know that it's it's quite easy to get kind of lost in the details, especially when talking about metabolic pathways, my goal here is not to provide kind of a detailed reaction mechanism for every step of this reaction, but rather to kind of just cover the high yield steps, the steps that are kind of the most important, I think, for you to be able to take away. All right, so once we're in the cytoplasm and we have acetyl-CoA, at our disposal, turns out that the first step of fatty acid synthesis is to charge up this molecule to a higher energy molecule called malonyl CoA. And just for the fact that I'm saying charging up this molecule should clue you into the fact that this is thermodynamically unfavorable, and so we need something that is thermodynamically favorable to be coupled with this reaction, and indeed, that is the hydrolysis of ATP, which I'll just write shorthand here as, as ATP going to ADP plus a free phosphate group. Now it might be tempting to think that we're charging up this acetyl-CoA molecule with this phosphate group here, but what we're really doing actually is we're charging it up with a carbon dioxide molecule. And the breakdown, this hydrolysis of ATP is really what's fueling this reaction forward. So to give you a sense of what kind of this looks like chemically, let me go ahead and draw out the chemical structure of these two molecules. So acetyl-CoA, we begin with this kind of two carbon backbone structure that we call an acyl group. So carbon double bonded to oxygen and also bonded to this carbon CH3 group here is attached to a coenzyme A group via a sulfur atom here. And I'm gonna leave this CoA group abbreviated like this just for simplicity. And our malonyl CoA group looks very similar. So we have a carbon double bond to oxygen. Our coenzyme A group is untouched. But we end up, you know, plopping off a hydrogen here and essentially adding on this carbon dioxide molecule like such. And I'll go ahead and put a hydrogen here just just for now, but it, it might be a protonated or it might not be depending on the pH of the solution, obviously. But just to kind of give you a sense here, this is what malonyl-CoA looks like. Now after this activation step, we're ready to polymerize. We're ready to put these malonyl-CoA molecules together to form the 16-carbon palmitic fatty acid. So to do this, it turns out that this carbon dioxide molecule that we added to this malonyl-CoA group, it plops off once again. So it might kind of seem weird to you that we're adding a carbon dioxide molecule and it plops off again, but what this is really doing, as I'll touch on in a bit, is it's making this overall reaction thermodynamically favorable because otherwise it wouldn't be able to occur. And notably, we also happen to lose some water molecules as well in the process. And this is also where the addition of NADPH comes in because we need the NADPH to reduce these carbon double bonds, as I mentioned earlier, so that we can create that nice string of carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds that is what forms the bulk of our fatty acid. Now I do wanna get the stoichiometry right here and remind you that what I've written out here, this loss of one water molecule and this loss of the carbon dioxide group and the addition of these two NADPH molecules is for each subsequent addition of these two carbon subunits. So every time we make another cycle, we're gonna have another two NADPH and another loss of carbon dioxide and another loss of water. And that will essentially continue until we've built this 16 carbon palmitic acid chain. 
before I touch more on this polymerization, let me just actually scroll down here and talk a little bit about the enzymes that are carrying out these kind of two major steps. So the first enzyme that carries out this activation step has a very nice name that's easy to remember. It's called acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So essentially, it tells us exactly what it's doing. It's adding a carboxy group to this acetyl-CoA molecule. And what's important about this particular enzyme, let me scroll down a little bit more here, is that it ends up being a very highly regulated part of this entire sequence. Now the reason this is a really good step to regulate is because it happens to be the rate limiting step of this entire fatty acid synthesis pathway. In other words, out of all the chemical reactions that occur, this one is the slowest kinetically. And so, because the entire rate, the overall rate, how fast this, this fatty acid synthesis pathway can occur is limited by this one step, it makes sense that we should essentially regulate whether this step is on or off. And the way we do this is by allosteric regulation, which if you remember is a specific molecule binding to a non-active site portion of this enzyme to make it work better or worse, or can also regulate it with hormones as well. So I'm going to say hormonal. So I just want to mention a couple of these that are going to be relevant. So first off we have citrate which is an allosteric activator of this enzyme. It makes it work, makes this enzyme work better and hence increases the flow through this pathway. And this kind of makes sense to me because I think of the citrate shuttle that's shuttling all this acetyl-CoA to the cytoplasm. More acetyl-CoA means that we should take advantage of this acetyl-CoA and make more fatty acids, hence kind of moving this pathway forward. In terms of hormones, the hormone that activates this pathway is insulin. And this makes sense to me again because I know that right after, you know, chowing down on that cheeseburger, we know that our levels of glucose in our blood are also going to rise. And so, you know, if we have a lot of extra glucose around, we're going to have a lot of extra acetyl-CoA. Hence, again, once again, we want to move this acetyl-CoA down this pathway to produce more fatty acids. Now, in terms of inhibitors, Allosterically, it turns out that fatty acids, especially I'll say long chain fatty acids, can inhibit this enzyme. And the way I like to think about this is it's just kind of a form of product inhibition. If we have too many fatty acids being produced, this process is basically the cell is saying, hey, you know, acetyl CoA carboxylase, you can slow down a little bit. We have more than we need. And in terms of hormones, the hormone that inhibits this enzyme is glucagon as well as a couple of others, but this is one of the main ones. And the way I like to think about this is kind of twofold. So remember that glucagon levels rise several hours after a meal once we have low blood glucose levels. So if we don't have an excess of glucose, we're not going to have an excess of acetyl-CoA, and so we won't want to be you know, forming all of these fatty acids. But I also remember that glucagon, the rising levels of glucagon also signal those adipose cells to release those fatty acids into the bloodstream for all of our cells to break down to produce more ATP. So if we're in a state of kind of net breaking down of fatty acids, we don't want to be simultaneously building them back up because ultimately we want to be able to, in this phase at least, extract the energy by breaking those fatty acids down. Now I want to mention what the enzyme is called that polymerizes these malonyl-CoA subunits together to form this palmitic acid. And the name of this enzyme is also quite easy to remember. It's called fatty acid synthase. So we're synthesizing a fatty acid. Now, as you probably saw from this arrow, there's a lot of things going on here. We're adding NADPH molecules, the carbon dioxide molecules falling off, and water is falling off too. And we're not going to go over all of the reactions that occur in this enzyme, but I think if we scroll down here a little bit, it'll be helpful to kind of just get a sense for how these carbon-carbon bonds are forming. Now, to save us some time, I've pre-drawn a couple of things that I want to go ahead and explain to you right now. So starting here on the left, what I've drawn here is the fatty acid synthase enzyme. And what I want to kind of draw your attention to, obviously this isn't what the enzyme actually looks like, but a representative drawing is the fact that it has two identical subunits shown here, and they each have a thiol group or a sulfur hydrogen group located here in the active site region. So the very first step of this polymerization reaction is actually to start off with both a molecule of acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA. And one acetyl-CoA molecule attaches to one of those sulfur groups, 
and the malonyl-CoA molecule attaches to the other sulfur group so that they're in close vicinity of one, one another. But I do want to point out that obviously these are no longer called acetyl-CoA and malonyl-CoA because you can notice here that there's no coenzyme A anywhere. And indeed, when these carbons here formed a bond with the sulfur atom on these enzymes, they lost their coenzyme A group. So that's kind of where we lose our coenzyme A group right here. Now in terms of carbon-carbon bond formation, I want us to put on our organic chemistry hats on for a moment. Now I've already told you, you know, up above here when we were looking at this reaction mechanism, that we lose this carbon dioxide molecule that we've added in this malonyl-CoA molecule. But how does this impact the carbon-carbon bond formation? So here I want you to notice that when this decarboxylates, when these electrons decide, hey, let me form a double bond here and let me kind of plop off of this molecule, that these electrons now make this carbon very nucleophilic. In other words, these two electrons want to bond with something. And so what they'll do is they'll see the nearest carbon that has a suitable leaving group around, and it happens to be this carbon right here because this enzyme is nicely putting us in vicinity of another carbon bond. And when it makes this carbon bond, this carbon will say, hey, I like that bond a little bit better. I'll plop off and give you my extra electrons. So what we've done essentially is we've made a carbon-carbon bond and we've freed a space here to allow the input of another malonyl-CoA molecule. And this cycle will continue to repeat us making carbon-carbon bonds until we form the 16-carbon palmitic acid. Now I know we haven't really covered where the NADPH comes in to reduce these carbons bonded to oxygen or where there's a loss of water, but I will actually mention that it's, it's quite similar to the reverse of beta oxidation, which you can take a look at as well. But ultimately, after all of that is done, after we make this carbon bond, which I think is, is, is the most crucial part of this fatty acid synthesis, and we reduce those carbons bonded to oxygens, ultimately we form this 16 carbon palmitic acid, which I've drawn the structure of below. So it's a completely saturated fatty acid that we can use to make longer chain fatty acids if need be. And I want to remind you that the ultimate fate of these fatty acids, remember they're going to be attached to a glycerol backbone to form a triacylglyceride molecule, and those are going to be sent off by the liver via VLDL particles to essentially deliver these fats to the rest of our tissues.